Okay, let me start. I'll share a screen and we can start today's um, material. So on uh, Monday's class, we talked a bit um, about some of the kinds of work that was going on uh, largely within Germany or at least other parts of, of Europe, but a lot of it right within uh, Germany itself uh, around topics like um, the discovery of nuclear fission and early efforts to, to uh, put nuclear fission to, to more practical use, including both for um, early ideas about, about nuclear weapons as well as for uh, power generation, nuclear reactors. And we saw that that was deeply, deeply bound up or kind of caught up in this head spinning swirl of, of, of the onrush toward the Second World War, the rise of the Nazis, soon overt fighting across Europe and of course much, much beyond that before long. So, that, so, so Monday's class was largely about developments within Europe. And today we'll talk about a, a range of developments mostly in the United States. And so we have, uh, as usual, three main parts for the class. Here at the bottom is, is my note reminding us again, as I just mentioned, about the film, The Day After Trinity. <clears throat> and I wanted to add that note because the, the, the course material today, the lecture for today, is mostly gonna be looking at kind of conceptual ideas, physics and engineering ideas, as well as new institutions or institutional arrangements in which many physicists began to find themselves. And we won't be talking in today's class session about broader uh, uh, questions, ethical, moral, contextual, about the actual use of these new weapons. And that's partly why I want to make sure that we do have time to talk about that, uh, at, least, at least to start those discussions with our optional um, discussion section on Monday. So today will be not exactly a technical history of the, of the wartime projects, but we'll get into a bit more, what did physicists mostly in the United States kind of find themselves being, being drawn into or being wrapped up with uh, during the uh, late 30s and throughout the, the much of the 1940s. So we'll, we'll start actually by talking a bit about radar, which often gets kind of overlooked these days. The drama of the nuclear weapons uh, tends to obscure many, many other uh, kind of full tilt defense projects or weapons projects that physicists and engineers uh, were really immersed in during the war. And so we'll talk about radar um, for a good chunk of, of today. And then we'll shift and talk about some aspects of the Manhattan Project and, and, and the film will, will cover uh, other kinds of aspects in addition. <clears throat> so let's talk first about radar. So radar was, was around since before the Second World War. The, the first working units have been developed actually in many countries kind of independently, simultaneous discovery is a phrase that historians will often use. There were groups working independent of each other uh, in uh, different countries in Europe and the UK, uh, some in the United States, in Japan, in the Soviet Union and other places it's been found, that all came across similar ideas, came upon similar ideas in the mid 1930s. The idea for radar is to emit electromagnetic waves, Maxwell waves, classical radiation, let those waves reflect off of some target, some object, and then collect the echo, collect the rebound. Uh, the, the, the reflected waves that come back to your device. And then you can do things like use the fact that these are Maxwell waves, they're electromagnetic waves, they should be traveling at a constant speed of light. And so you can, if you have very good electronics, good timing, then you should be able to tell the difference, measure the difference between when you sent out your own pulse, when you generated your waves, and when you received the echo. So that gives you the time and if you know the constant speed at which those waves are traveling, you can then determine the distance toward that object or your target. That was the original idea. There were working units, uh, as I say, in many parts of the world already by the early and mid 1930s. More sophisticated units that were developed actually during the, the Second World War, so by the early 1940s, built in a very clever addition, which was to measure not just the time of arrival of that echo, but also measure the frequency shift. They had very quick Doppler analyzers to measure the shift in the frequency of the, of the return signal compared to the signal that the unit had sent out. So then you could actually measure um, the speed, at least speed along the line of sight uh, of the target object as well. So now these devices could measure both distance and speed of the targets uh, already before, um, largely much of that before the start of, of, of the war. So both British and US based researchers had developed these long wavelength radar systems. And by long, that meant the wavelength was measured in, in meters, sometimes tens or even hundreds of meters, more like kind of radio waves. Uh, 
Um, and those were what, were what had been operational uh, before the start of the war. And then once the war actually broke out, once the UK declared war against Germany and, and US began to mobilize even before it declared war officially, that was really one of the most, one of the earliest uh, experiences that many, many physicists in these parts of the world had with a direct involvement with, with military matters. So it was the radar project that was for many, many physicists and other engineers, uh, physical science-based engineers. This was for many of their first uh, experience working closely on, on direct military projects. So one of the first challenges, a, a real, a genuine hard research challenge was to design new kinds of radars that use much shorter wavelength waves. So make the outgoing signal not meters or tens of meters, but more like centimeters or at most say tens of centimeters. We want to shrink down the wavelength of the, of the outgoing signal. And that was because the, the nature of the challenge uh, had shifted quite dramatically. Remember with shorter wavelengths, you can, you can resolve, you can make sharper images of smaller scaled things. Uh, if you have only have a very long wavelength wave, you'll never be able to make out short scale, short distance phenomena. Why would they need suddenly to worry about centimeter scale phenomena instead of meters? After all, airplanes you know, are many meters long uh, or large boats on, on the water. The problem was beginning with right around the outbreak of, of the war itself, the famous or infamous uh, German submarines, the U-boats, had become an enormous threat, a very deadly threat to both US and UK shipping interests, both for commercial shipping, uh, but also for, for naval uh, you know, ships as well. Now the boats uh, were ordinarily underwater. They were basically impervious to this kind of radar. But, they, but if a part of the boat would, would breach the surface, often as little as just a periscope, just a little you know, kind of sighting device to allow the, the, the uh, members on the, on the German subs to, to sort of see their, their targets, if that breached the water, that would be a couple centimeter scale target for these radars. So in order to, to try to have any hope against this now very deadly force of the German U-boats, the radar challenge became to find centimeter scale radar systems, not just meters or tens of meters. Okay, so by 1940, uh, just a few months into the real heart of the U-boat campaign, uh, physicists and engineers within the UK had, had really made a huge advance. They had developed what became called the cavity magnetron. And here's one shown uh, in the image here. You don't get a, a clear sense of scale. This is just a couple centimeters across. You can hold it in your hand. This is a handheld scale device that could emit very high power, high intensity electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves of this shorter wavelength of roughly one or, or early ones are about three centimeter wavelength instead of meters. So you could create very powerful outgoing beams of short wavelength electromagnetic waves. By that time, however, uh, the UK was under both bombardment from the air, the German uh, uh, Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, was now doing uh, very, very successful bombing runs, uh, penetrating London airspace routinely and, and with devastating effects. So the, 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 um, the blitz, the bombing in London and other parts of, of Britain was, was nearly constant. Uh, and so it seemed impossible to kind of scale up this kind of bench top level research into really full scale research development and production. So they knew how to make one or two of these devices. They didn't know how to make factories worth humming around the clock to make hundreds and thousands of these devices because that kind of industrial capacity was under constant threat from bombardment. So uh, in the autumn of 1940, uh, and remember that's more than one whole year before the US even officially entered the war. So long before the surprise attack on uh, Pearl Harbor, which finally uh, was sort of the, the reason why the United States officially entered the Second World War. Long before that, a British delegation came over, uh, quite a dangerous journey, and they came over by, by boat, uh, despite the German uh, submarines. It was a delegation led by Sir Henry Tizard. It became known as the Tizard delegation. They came to the United States and they set up a meeting in Washington DC to try to get US based colleagues to partner and ultimately kind of take over the lead on these next steps for radar development. They wanted to cooperate, but especially have a kind of safer home base uh, or headquarters at which this, uh, within which this work could then be um, expanded. They came over with lots of blueprints, lots of paperwork, and also literally one, one cavity magnetron. They were so rare and they were in such high demand back in Britain 
They could spare only one to hand over to their US colleagues. And the idea was between the paperwork, the specs and the blueprints and the technical reports, and literally the one working device, the hope was that these groups in the US could kind of reverse engineer this thing, make many more of them and improve the design. So at this meeting, which was held in a, a fancy hotel uh, in Washington, DC, uh, there were, it was a small group of US colleagues who attended, who met with Tizard and his British uh, team, but it included a, a heavy dose of MIT folks. So in particular, it included uh, Van Iver Bush, who had only just recently left MIT by that point to work full-time in science policy and science advising in Washington, DC. But he, until that time, he'd been the Dean of Engineering at MIT, came from electrical engineering himself. Uh, likewise, attending this meeting was Carl Compton, the physicist who at this point was president of MIT. There was a, a kind of a, a dominant MIT presence in this top secret meeting in, the, in this Washington DC hotel. Uh, and at one point, Compton actually literally stepped out of this meeting to, to place a phone call to one of his assistants who was back here on campus at MIT to see if MIT could spare space to be the, to the place to build up the headquarters for this new allied effort and radar, the biggest stumbling block was that there was a big uh, faculty parking lot in the middle of campus. And uh, you might know that then as now faculty parking is like super precious and rare. And so the concern that the president of MIT had was whether the campus could basically take over that parking lot uh, to build this temporary um, uh, laboratory to, to do work on radar. And the grudging response was yes, that's where the MIT's famous building 20 then wound up being built. None of you probably has seen Building 20. It was torn down in the mid 90s. It was a temporary building literally built out of like plywood. It was not meant to outlast the duration of the war. It was in constant use, in fact, for 55 years, much beloved on campus. It was only torn down to make space for what's now the Stata Center. And here's a, a picture you can see the 1940s vehicles. It was literally a temporary, large scale, but temporary facility right in the middle of campus, famous Building 20. That became the original headquarters then for the MIT based allied efforts in radar. It became known as the Radiation Laboratory or just the Rad Lab. Okay, so this project became one of the largest, earliest and largest uh, projects sponsored by this new institution within the United States called the National Defense Research Committee or the NDRC. This was also a kind of brainchild of MIT's Van Iver Bush. So Bush uh, had, uh, by, because of his time in DC, he knew a, a US president, Franklin Roosevelt, he convinced Roosevelt and Roosevelt's immediate circle of advisors that the US, although it was still not officially at war, should begin kind of mobilizing or getting ready. It looked like war could spill out and involve the US at any time. So Bush's idea was to make a kind of a meeting place, an institution that could help connect researchers in science and engineering, some at universities, some at industrial laboratories in the private sector, connect them with, the, with US military officials. The idea was the, the military could come to, to Bush's organization, the NDRC, say, we really need a better this or a better that. Could you please get people to work on it? So the NDRC would be the kind of meeting ground to help arrange these contacts. So a, a little while later, roughly one year later, still well before the US even entered the war, Van Iver Bush convinced Roosevelt to actually, that that wasn't enough. That just being able to arrange for, um, for uh, research contracts was, was actually insufficient. And that in fact, there should be an even uh, an expanded institutional base that became known as the OSRD, the Office of Scientific Research and Development and, the idea, and that Bush would lead that. So not only would the OSRD kind of let out contracts like the older model, but it would actually have a much more active and ongoing role in production. It wouldn't just say, you're, here's your contract, tell us when you're done. It would have a, a, a kind of steady oversight role to make sure these things are getting done on time and on budget. This next part is really just for uh, Professor Gensler's benefit, but I find it fascinating. One of the things that stands out from Van Iver Bush's strategy was to use contracts rather than grants, let alone gifts, to make it look like these were kind of equal partners entering into a business arrangement. I find this actually very fascinating. So uh, the last thing Van Iver Bush wanted would be anything like a federal takeover or a federal bailout uh, of higher education, that universities should be independent from the federal government. And so instead, if it looked like two equal partners coming to do business together, like in the private sector, we'll have contracts with overhead and all these kinds of affordances of a business to business style contract, as opposed to a grant or a gift or anything like that. 
So in actual fact, the universities were completely desperate for funds. This was now nearly a decade into the Great Depression. All of these universities were facing enormously difficult financial times, but Bush wanted to maintain the kind of appearance of equal partners arranging contracts as opposed to anything else. It's, uh, I find that really interesting. Okay, so what's going on then at MIT? Here's a photograph from the top. There was a rooftop facility temporarily built, uh, not just in building 20, but even in part of the infinite corridor. This was now on, this, on the roof of building four, part of the, you know, the infinite corridor there. So they had many, many uh, kind of sites on campus. So the Rad Lab grew very, very quickly. It began once the green light was given and they could throw that plywood palace together, building 20, they began uh, attracting staff to it. At first they hired 30 physicists, most of whom were not previously at MIT. They came from other universities across uh, the country. They had three security guards, which is a top secret um, effort right in the middle of campus, two stockroom clerks and one kind of administrative secretary, not so big. It was led by a nuclear physicist, not an engineer uh, or even an electromagnetic expert. The physicist Lee Dubridge, who at the time was at uh, Rochester University in upstate New York, he was recruited to leave to temporarily leave his job and moved to MIT to be the kind of scientific director for this. But it quickly uh, grew well beyond physics or even electrical engineering. It included meteorology, uh, experts in geology, what we now call material science, even linguistics. How do you how do you identify uh, signal from noise and so on, it grew very rapidly. In fact, uh, after less than two years of operation, the staff numbered 2,000, not just 30, and it doubled again before the end of the war. So by the end of the war, it had 500 academic physicists, a very large fraction of all the PhD, PhD physicists in American universities altogether, a huge fraction were recruited to the Rad Lab. Uh, it was by, by this point spending a million dollars per month if you adjust for inflation to our contemporary currency, that's about a $15 million per month budget. They were burning through cash very rapidly. And this became the largest part of actually a very large suite of uh, defense projects that were being done at MIT throughout the war, totaling again in today's dollars, uh, about one and a half billion dollars. MIT became by a very, very wide margin, the single largest university contractor for wartime projects in the United States and in fact, it was even a bigger contractor for these research and development projects than some of the largest industrial companies in the country, AT&T, General Electric, RCA, DuPont, Westinghouse. The, the research and development contracts from the OSRD that came to MIT were three times more than even those huge industrial behemoths. Now those, those companies got huge contracts for production like building airplanes and engines and all the rest, but for the actual R&D, MIT became an enormous, enormous node of this OSRD. So the Rad Lab staff, now they had 4,000 people by late stages in the war, they were very busy. They designed dozens of different radar systems, not just one uh, type of system from that one cavity magnetron, but really dozens of variations. So you wanted to have say ground to air to get early warning about aircraft, uh, air to sea, um, ground to sea, and so on. Now these were all in the kind of centimeter range, a couple centimeters. So they were all were of that new type, uh, but now adapted to different kinds of um, tactical needs. They would conduct tests for, literally from MIT rooftops to see if their um, if their kind of uh, beta vision beta versions could detect actual aircraft from nearby airports, which are now uh, the Hanscom Air Force Base uh, in the western suburbs in what's now called Logan Airport, both um, Air Force and uh, commercial aircraft. And they also trained nearly 10,000 active duty service members from across the United States. They would come to campus for very brief, very intense training in how to use these new systems and then be shipped out and use them operationally. Now, at first, many of the theoretical physicists who were recruited to the Rad Lab, they were even by their own lights, pretty arrogant. That's not just me saying so, many of them came to that conclusion themselves. After all, they came in saying, oh, radar, that's." That's just classical physics. That's merely Maxwell's equations. How hard could that be? They had, many of them had been immersed in these kind of very fancy esoteric ideas about quantum theory or nuclear physics of the sort we've talked about in recent sessions here. They were quickly schooled. They learned very quickly that calculating the actual electromagnetic field configurations for real devices, not just the kind that they assigned to their students on problem sets, was, as we physicists say, non-trivial, means it was really, really hard. This was not at all an easy task. 
So as you all know, and are still learning, as we still use in our own more mature research, oftentimes it's very, very important and very helpful to exploit symmetries to simplify calculations, imagine a spherical symmetry, or if you really must, a cylindrical symmetry, so two dimensions of space can be treated the same way and one third one's different. That was gonna get you absolutely nowhere when it came to these real world devices like radar. Here's an example of just some of the so-called components, these waveguide components that were already in standard use by this time, by the mid 1940s. Few of these could be, uh, could be treated as a cylinder. None of them could be treated as a sphere. And these are just components. The actual parts of these radar devices, like here's one schematic, uh, would be you know, putting all these together in these complicated forms. There is no symmetry argument that's gonna help you there. So what the physicists began to learn, uh, and again, many of them recalled this years afterwards, was really a whole new way to think about their own calculations. And here they credited, many of them credited the engineers with whom they were suddenly and often for the first time working very closely, credited the engineers for helping them to learn a whole new way to think about their own calculations. To think about effective circuits, don't start from kind of uh, individual uh, basic parts, and even more, more basically focus on kind of input output relationships. So you might have a, a particular circuit for part of that radar system that would have a bunch of resistors, some in parallel, some in series, you have capacitors, you have all these kind of messy electronic components. And although it is the case that one can simplify these mathematically the and, and find an effective circuit uh, using things like Ohm's law, the engineers would say, don't even waste your chalkboard time on that. Stick a lead on over here, stick a lead on over here. What's the current flowing in? What's the current flowing out? Infer an effective overall resistance, have an effective circuit based on the input and the output and stop it. You don't have time to do this kind of thing. Plus when you're faced with those crazy, crazy shaped waveguides, even these simplifying mathematics would be no help. So several physicists, including this gentleman here, uh, Julian Schwinger, who, who spent the war working at the Rad Lab, uh, they later recall that this new approach, this kind of engineering input output approach to problem solving really shaped how they thought about research questions even after the war was over. And that's a little bit of a, uh, a foreshadowing. We'll, we'll look at some of the lessons that Schwinger took from his radar experience uh, when he returned to challenges in quantum theory. We'll look at that in, in a few class sessions. Okay, so by 1943, so in roughly two and a half, three years into kind of full scale operations for the Rad Lab, these kinds of units were actually developed and deployed all over the, the so-called theaters of battle. They were uh, not only used in ground-based scanning stations, uh, they were also put on board aircraft, on board naval vessels. They began finally to turn the tide against the devastating uh, German submarines, the U-boat campaigns, as well as the Luftwaffe uh, uh, bombing raids over, uh, over Britain. Uh, it turns out these systems were not only in some sense defensive, it wasn't only trying to get early warning of an incoming attack, though they turned out to be very effective at that. These also became very important for, for, for offensive weapons, for, for, uh, <clears throat> for weapons that would, that would uh, go and, and attack the enemy. And so one of the most substantial was actually at a related OSRD project, uh, the so-called Applied Physics Laboratory associated with Johns Hopkins University uh, near Baltimore, which was set up in a similar fashion to MIT's Rad Lab. And one of the most important things there was developing the proximity fuse. So this would actually embed, it was really quite amazing, embed miniature radar units in the warheads, in the tips of these artillery shells. So now the, the, each, uh, each kind of artillery shell that would be fired from these very large cannons would carry its own kind of ranging device. So it could tell in real time how close it was getting to it to a given target. So you could then wire these things up to explode, to actually uh, detonate, not any old time, but only when they were within some preset distance from the target. And that had an enormous impact on the offense. Previously, these anti-aircraft efforts, like shooting these big uh, guns from a naval vessel against incoming aircraft, they typically had to fire hundreds of rounds, these very expensive rounds, to hit a single fast-moving airplane. They were, had a very bad uh, return on investment, so to speak. They were not very effective. Once the, these same shells now were, were equipped with these proximity fuses, they needed on average two, not hundreds, to, to successfully strike an incoming aircraft. So after the war, it became common, especially for veterans of the Rad Lab, of the Applied Physics Lab, 
to say that nuclear weapons of the sort that we'll talk about for the rest of today and on the film, that these weapons might have ended the war, but it was radar, they said, that had won the war. So let me pause there and uh, take some questions. I see the chat is filling up. <clears throat> so Fisher's right. So Building 20 is indeed uh, on, on the campus location where, where the uh, Stata Center now is. Uh, and whether that's uh, an ugly building or a beautiful building, we can all decide. But indeed, that was, um, it's sort of, a, it's, you know, a, a, a building of real legend. It, it was really supposed to last like five years and it was in constant use for 55 years, much beloved. There's a time capsule uh, within Stata, so on the same physical location. So when, when we can all get back on campus, I encourage you to go take a look at it. For those of you who might, uh, like me, still be remote. There's a time capsule in Stata of rad lab materials and memorabilia. Uh, they wanted to have it on the same physical site and it will be sealed until sometime later in the 21st century. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, anyway, so that's uh, a, a, a large part of MIT's role uh, and kind of legacy during the Second World War. So Hastings asks, how is the original radar built if it was so non-trivial? Yeah, good. So it, the, the, the non-trivial part was mostly shrinking it down to short wavelengths and having a means of generating high power, high intensity waves of that short wavelength, and also getting very careful electronics to detect the echo, getting even fancier electronics to detect any kind of frequency shift, the Doppler shift. The original idea of getting a big, basically a big radio tower, send out large multimeter wavelength waves. People have been sort of generating radio frequency waves um, since around 1900s, the 1890s. Think about Marconi and other other people. So just generating long wavelength radio waves and detecting them, that's kind of like what radio does. You have to have a little more sensitivity to get the right radar echo and get the timing right. But that part was indeed close to a kind of trial and error, or let's say building on established engineering principles, but getting it really um, to work with short wavelengths, much finer resolution, both for time and frequency. That was much more tricky. Uh, uh, Gary tells us that uh, his, his, his own father was uh, experienced in the war. He was, I say, a mere corporal. Uh, it, yeah, so we found himself a tale because you, you're, you're getting ahead of ourselves here. So Gary, you, you will, we'll see photographs of the sorts of experiences your father indeed might have had and also more in the film as well. There, by the way, much like Gary is reminding us of, um, there was a, 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 a large number of people who were stationed at places like Los Alamos and other, other uh, Manhattan Project sites who were part of what was called the SED, the Special Engineering Detachment. These were people who were, who were um, drafted. They were not recruited specially for the scientific project. Many of them had a high school level education, had some aptitude for physics and math, but were not kind of full-time science students or engineering students. But if they had any aptitude with like using their hands, you know, like radio kits and so on, many of them were sent to this special engineering detachment to these high powered labs. And that's where many of them got their first kind of real exposure to, to higher level kind of uh, uh, laboratory work. And several of them then decided to cha change their, their life path. And many of them then decided to go and study uh, these topics more formally in graduate school to get a PhD to become professors when before that they had never dreamed of such things. So that SED detachment uh, played a, a largely kind of unsung role in a lot of these wartime laboratories. Uh, so Alex is right. So not only, by the way, were the, were the proximity fuses so secret, he's absolutely right. They could only be fired over the open water in the beginning. That They relaxed that by the end of the war. But the fear was if, if one of these uh, failed to detonate and it landed on the ground, could the enemy troops capture it and then reverse engineer it. So exactly as Alex very rightly reminds us, these proximity fuses, especially in the early rounds, literally rounds, were, were limited only to naval, um, to naval operations. So if it didn't explode, the enemy couldn't capture it. I think it's just extraordinary. Fisher asked, what was the status of radar in Germany? Uh, they had some prototypes. Yeah, that's right. So again, uh, that's one of the places where there had been early working units even before the start of the Second World War in the 30s. Um, there were, again, efforts to improve them, but much like we saw in Monday's class, everyone, especially the Germans, thought that Germany would win the war immediately. The Blitzkrieg was just blindingly successful uh, in the early, early months and years. So they figured, why bother sinking a lot of research? You know, The one exception to that, by the way, was Peenemunde, the effort to develop uh, rockets. So that really was invested in very heavily. And of course, it did have a, a real impact even during the war itself. 
But for a lot of these other kind of high technology wartime projects, the Germans tended not to invest so heavily because they thought they'd win. And then when the tide turned, they said, oh, we're not winning, but now we have to divert resources to, to proven technologies. Um, and then, yes, and we also have Alex, uh, Alex reminds us we can also thank microwaves for burnt popcorn and so much more, like most of our lunches probably during the pandemic. Any other questions about, about radar or burnt lunches? Okay, let's switch gears now. Let me let go back to sharing screen. These are great questions. Let's go back now and, and we will shift now to the other sort of most famous project of the OSRD, the Manhattan Project. So I do wanna emphasize over the course of the war, this Office of Scientific Research and Development with Vannevar Bush at its head oversaw literally thousands of defense projects for the military. It wasn't like there were only two or three. It wasn't just radar, proximity fuse, and Manhattan Project. There were literally thousands of funded projects. The, the biggest though, the most, um, the largest in terms of personnel and budget, and arguably in terms of impact on the course of the war, were indeed radar, uh, and, then, and then the one we'll turn to now with the project for nuclear weapons. So this other main project was officially called the Manhattan Engineer District, or the MED. Uh, of course, it was rapidly shortened to just the nickname the Manhattan Project. Why was it called the Manhattan Project? It actually started the first kind of headquarters for the first very small planning office was in Manhattan. It was, it was a joint project between this OSRD and uh, the War Department, in particular, the US Army Corps of Engineers, longstanding organization within the Army. And the Corps then as now has these kind of regional offices. There's a Corps uh, to, you know, to oversee things around say the Mississippi River, there's a core uh, office for the Northeast and so on. There's a regional structure for the, Corps, for the Army Corps of Engineers then as now. And it was the Manhattan office that was made in charge of this early on quite modest scale effort to begin investigating uh, fission for weapons purposes. So they were literally headquartered in New York City and that wasn't entirely random. Some of the earliest scientist consultants on this project were at Columbia University in, in New York City including Enrico Fermi, who had just, as we saw last time, had just left Italy upon receiving his Nobel Prize in December of 1938. By January of 1939, he was then basically set up at Columbia and many of his colleagues there. So that's why it was originally called, uh, named for Manhattan. Very, very quickly, this project grew well beyond that small little planning office. In fact, it included more than 30 sites across both the US and Canada. Over the course of the war, it wound up applying, employing more than 125,000 people. It was a massive, massive project, far, far larger than radar in terms of personnel. And of course, the overwhelming majority of those people, of those 125,000 people who were paid by the Manhattan Project during the war, most of them had almost no idea of what the, what the project was actually about. It was a very, very tight, uh, control of information flow. And you'll hear more about that even in, in the film, Day After Trinity. So although these people were officially working on the Manhattan Project, uh, very few of them had any idea about what the project was even aiming to do, let alone uh, the relevant details. So among these 30 sites, there are four that really um, were, were most uh, critical to the project and that get talked about most often. And again, you'll hear more about these um, in the film. And those four are highlighted here on the map, uh, Chicago, uh, Illinois, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, Hanford, Washington, uh, and Los Alamos, New Mexico. The film is largely uh, about developments at Los Alamos, but it does uh, give us insights into these other four main, uh, the other three main sites as well. We're going to take a tour today at some of the, a, a brief tour of some of the kinds of work that was being done at each of those four uh, main sites during the war. We're going to start with Chicago. That, that installation, that part of this very large sprawling project, was called the Metallurgical Laboratory. They weren't doing metallurgy. These names are always meant to kind of throw off suspicion. It wasn't actually, you know, basically material science or chemistry, uh, but they gave it a name to sound kind of innocuous. By this point, Fermi had moved from Columbia to the University of Chicago. He moved pretty rapidly upon emigrating to the US, and he was one of the main leaders then of the Chicago Met Lab, as it was known uh, for short. The, the, the Metallurgical Laboratory took the lead on trying to further understand these still quite new fission reactions. Uh, and that was what Fermi had been working on even before he even sort of knew it, uh, went back from his Rome days and certainly one of his main interests uh, once he arrived at Columbia. So the Met Lab was focusing on sort of the physics and chemistry of fission. 
one of the first things I did was build this monster here. It was known by the code name Chicago Pile One. You can see it's literally a pile. This was the first working nuclear reactor in the world. It was built, as some of you may know, under the, the stadium seating of, uh, the, of the big um, Stag Field Stadium on campus. Was, they were underground uh, squash courts, like racquetball courts. And they, over, during the war, in secret, took over some of those underground facilities to start developing and building the first working nuclear reactor. No one above ground was told that they have a bunch of uranium underneath. So what was their goal? Each time a uranium nucleus underwent fission, additional neutrons were released. This was not so obvious at first at the, with the experiments from Hahn and Strassmann in Berlin, but this is exactly the sort of thing that a lot of US-based labs and, and elsewhere began to, uh, to identify and then to confirm as soon as Niels Bohr arrived in New York and let his US-based colleagues hear about fission. Once people began replicating the basic fission reaction in their labs, they could then hone in on the other uh, reaction products. And so it was clear by Fermi's time at the Met Lab that more neutrons came out each time uh, a single nucleus underwent fission. And that meant there was a prospect for getting a chain reaction. The first, uh, if you inject one neutron into the system, if this nucleus splits and gives out more than one uh, new neutron, each of those could split neighboring nuclei, then they would split more and more and more. It, would be an, it could become an exponential runaway process known as a chain reaction. So what was this pile? How did this reactor work? It consisted of 57 layers. You can count them up. I'm not sure all 57 were there yet, but it was literally stack upon stack upon stack of very closely packed ingredients. So most of this, most of the weight actually came from graphite bricks, carbon, you know, dense carbon bricks. Those were not uh, gonna undergo fission themselves. They're not a, a, a nuclear source. They were actually to slow down the neutrons. So each time a neutron flies out of one of these recently split nuclei, you wanted to interact with some moderating material. And it, and it turns out carbon was quite effective, the carbon inside this graphite, not to absorb the neutron, but to slow it down. Remember we saw uh, Lisa Meitner and uh, Robert Frisch had, had recognized that rea fission reaction rates in general should rise if the neutron is slowed down because then its quantum properties would be stretched out more to be comparable in size to the entire target nucleus. So the idea was to use some moderating material, some material that would slow down those neutrons by a few kind of um, collisions, not to absorb them. So that by the time the neutron then found a neighboring uranium nucleus, it would be uh, more likely to induce fission. So most of, this, of these piles are the graphite moderators. In between were little chunks of uranium metal, uh, some of which would hopefully undergo these, these reactions. And the last and quite critical uh, part of this were huge control rods, 14 foot long rods of purified cadmium metal. Why cadmium? The idea here was not to slow down the neutrons, but to absorb them. So cadmium will very readily absorb neutrons. So if you want to halt a chain reaction from say blowing up the um, entire University of Chicago, let alone the lovely uh, sports arena here, if you want to slow down or halt a fission reaction, you start taking neutrons out of the equation. You absorb these neutrons before they can find a target nucleus. So the graphite bricks moderate the energy of the neutrons, the cadmium control rods take them out of the, of the system altogether. And then these were movable. They could literally be manually in the earliest days, manually pushed in or pulled out to control the, the average number of neutrons sort of in play. And so with this arrangement, the very first self-sustaining chain reaction that got this re reaction to undergo uh, not a runaway chain reaction, a controlled chain reaction, thanks to those cadmium rods. That went critical, literally underneath the stands here, on December 2nd, 1942, under Fermi's direction. That was not quite a full year after the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. So you can see the pace begins to pick up very rapidly once the US did actually enter the war. The bombing of Pearl Harbor was December 7th, 1941, the so-called day that will live in infamy. And almost exactly a year later, Fermi's group in Chicago had produced the first self-sustaining chain reaction. Okay. Now, independent of that, kind of in parallel, there were developments going on at other uh, sites, which would also eventually become absorbed in the Manhattan Project. So another very important one was at Berkeley, California where a very young nuclear chemist, who's an assistant professor, just a few years past his own PhD, 
uh, named Glenn Seaborg, worked with a small team. He was a nuclear chemist. And they actually finally, finally succeeded in doing what Fermi had first thought he'd done back in the mid 1930s. So Fermi, remember we saw won the Nobel prize for essentially a mistake. Everyone, including the Nobel committee thought that Fermi had produced nuclei heavier than uranium by a neutron capture. Uh, although it turns out Fermi's group was inadvertently uh, inducing fission. Well, Seaborg and his team actually finally, so to speak, was able to successfully produce transuranic nuclei with the same mechanism that everyone thought had been already been going on. They could control it better and, and measure the products better. And so uh, early on, he and his team produced um, uh, neptunium by neutron capture followed by beta decay. And then a few months later, by very early 1941, Seaborg's team had produced the next uh, largest element on this new extended periodic table, plutonium. This was actually a single neutron capture followed by double beta decay. So the heavy uranium nucleus, one neutron undergoes beta decay, so the proton count has increased by one. Then a second neutron within that same nucleus will undergo beta decay, and now you increase the proton number uh, by another step. So now you've made element 94. The next month after first making very small trace amounts of this new element, Seaborg and his colleague Emilio Segre, Segre had himself left uh, Italy uh, because of Mussolini. He'd been a member of Fermi's group in Rome. He relocated to Berkeley. So the nuclear chemist Seaborg and the nuclear physicist Emilio Segre then began studying the properties of this brand new chemical element, plutonium. And particularly found that plutonium really is subject to nuclear fission, much like certain isotopes of uranium. Within months after that, Seaborg then went to what was by now this kind of flourishing Manhattan Project site, uh, the Met Lab in Chicago, to work more directly with Fermi and to continue measuring kind of the properties of plutonium and its uh, fission rings. So that's, that's what largely what's going on at Chicago during this time. Meanwhile, overseeing this entire project, the entire uh, Manhattan Project, was a member of the um, Army Corps of Engineers, the US uh, Brigadier General Leslie Groves. Until that time, Groves' largest project had been overseeing construction of the Pentagon building. Literally, the building itself was quite new by the late 30s, early 1940s. And Groves, who was an engineer, was a, a rising member of the US Army Corps of Engineers, had been like the head contractor. He'd overseen the construction of this enormous, enormous, strategically important uh, headquarters for uh, for the War Department. So he was seen as someone who could get things done on budget. He was then tapped to take over this newest new project of the Manhattan Project. And in fact, as you'll, again, you'll hear more about this in the film, Groves was very reluctant to do it. Uh, he actually was very eager to, to see combat once the US actually actively entered the Second World War. He wanted to be you know, leading troops in battle. And he thought this very abstract sounding weapons projects, something about nuclear fission, if it were to work at all, would have some long-term benefit or, or impact much down the road. Groves was eager to, to, to see you know, the, the, the scenes of battle directly. Nonetheless, he was more or less ordered to take this over and he was in the army, he followed his orders. So he was, he was then put in charge of this entire project. One of the first maneuvers he did, which really just stunned, stunned people around him, was he asked uh, the very young, theoretical physicist at Berkeley, Robert Oppenheimer, to join Groves as the scientific director for this new Los Alamos laboratory. And you'll hear a lot, a lot about Oppenheimer in the film. It actually functions as almost a kind of biography of young Robert Oppenheimer combined with the story of uh, these projects during the war. So I won't say too much now about Oppenheimer, but just to say this was a stunning move uh, on Groves's part, stunning at the time. So Los Alamos began operations and in the spring of 1943. If you may remember, the, the project was established in June of 42. So just getting things like the Chicago lab up and running uh, was really the, the, the earliest priority. And by the spring then, by spring of 1943, not quite a year into this new project, uh, this additional site, what would eventually become a kind of central coordinating site at Los Alamos, New Mexico was set up, as you'll see in the film, taking over what had been a very tiny, kind of boys school, young like K through 12 uh, academy in rural New Mexico with like mud caked small little facility. Oppenheimer used to enjoy vacationing in that region going on long camping and horseback riding trips. So it was actually Oppenheimer who, who recommended the site to Grove saying maybe we can requisition this out of the way place that could be well hidden and, and kept secret. 
So again, just a little bit about Oppenheimer and here's the poster for the film that you can learn much, much more. There, uh, is a, there are many, many very, very good books about Oppenheimer, including uh, this one that actually received the Pulitzer Prize. It's a, it's a, a, a spellbinding book as well as one based on enormously in, impressive research. Lots more to say about Oppenheimer. I'll just be brief. He was uh, a near contemporary of people like Werner Heisenberg and Wolfgang Pauli. He was roughly two years younger than Heisenberg, so pretty similar generation. Oppenheimer was a bit of a prodigy. He actually went to Harvard very young for his undergraduate studies. He had skipped grades you know, as a, as a younger student. And then he studied for his PhD in a, in a quick postdoctoral jaunt in Europe, both in Cambridge, England, and especially in Göttingen. He actually did his PhD under the direction of Max Born. So he was there just as the kind of brand new quantum theory, quantum mechanics was emerging. He got to meet many, many of those folks when he was a grad student there. He came back. He was hired to teach both at Berkeley and at Caltech. He was hired to be a full-time professor at two universities hundreds of miles apart. And both schools were so desperate to get him, they agreed to let him spend one semester at Berkeley and the next semester at Caltech. It's just extraordinary. And part of, the, part of his role, what they hoped uh, he could do, was build up a kind of US-based strength in theoretical physics, which was seen, I think, quite appropriately, quite accurately, as really lagging behind uh, the European schools by that point. Before the war, he had basically no experience with either experiments or with any sort of large scale organization, which is part of what made it so shocking when uh, General Groves asked him to, to play this very large administrative role for the wartime projects. Okay, so as soon as uh, this new uh, facility at Los Alamos began uh, to get built up, Oppenheimer's own former student, his postdoc Robert Serber, gave a series of initiation lectures for the new recruits who had been asked to come to this place, but not told why. It was so top secret, people were basically not told why they should drop everything and move to Nowheresville, uh, rural New Mexico. So Serber gave what was actually called a quote, indoctrination course, as if they were joining like a cult. There was another physicist, uh, Edward Condon, who took notes and typed them up. And this 24 page document became literally the first technical report of the laboratory. It was classified immediately, it was, it was a top secret report. This was Los Alamos report one, of which there, there would be thousands, in fact, probably tens of thousands then to follow. Informally, it became known as the Los Alamos primer. Decades later, it was declassified and, and published. And in fact, you can uh, actually just download the PDF of the original type, TypeScript uh, on the web. It's not hard to find. So this is from the actual document, the actual primer. On page one, the first thing he tells these people when they uh, meet together in Los Alamos is the following. The object of the project is to produce a practical military weapon in the form of a bomb in which the energy is released by a fast neutron chain reaction in one or more of the materials known to show nuclear fission. Lest there be any doubt, basically, we're here to build bombs. That's literally uh, the first thing he says uh, in these notes. The next thing he does is very, very quickly go over the kind of back of the envelope order of magnitude estimates for the energy released every time a single nucleus undergoes fission, exactly of the sort that we saw last time that uh, Lisa Meitner and Robert Frisch had been doing uh, not so long before and that I work out in more detail in those lecture notes for, from Monday's class. There's one really interesting shift though. I, I find this pretty fascinating. Uh, Cerber gets the same answer, but he chooses to write the, the energy uh, associated with these nuclear reactions, not in units associated with chemical or nuclear reactions like electron volts or maybe millions of electron volts. He writes down the energy in ergs. Remember, that's the unit of energy in the kind of human scaled units, centimeters, grams, and seconds. He's now not thinking about individual you know, reactions among one or two nuclei. He's already thinking about a human scale. Because the next maneuver he does in these notes is say, this is not very much on a human scale, right? A fly buzzing around your head expends more energy than this. However, that's for one nucleus uh, that's undergone fission. There are 10 to the 25 nuclei in a single kilogram of this stuff. So suddenly, if you could get this runaway chain reaction that he refers to here, if you can get lots and lots of these nuclei each to undergo fission, they'll each release that amount of energy. Now you're talking about some enormous uh, kind of reaction, not just uh, one isolated nucleus that happened to fission. Again, right on page one of these notes, the next thing he does is compare that kind of energy release with the energy associated with conventional chemical explosives like TNT or dynamite, basically. Those were well known 
to release something like uh, 10 to the 16 ergs per ton, not per kilogram of, uh, of chemical explosive, but per ton. So then again, right on page one, he then takes this ratio to say, this is why we're, people have gathered here in Los Alamos. One kilogram of this stuff, of, sorry, of a fissionable isotope, would give off the energy equivalent of 20,000 tons of conventional explosives. And let me just pause here to say he's used a code here. They were so worried about, about secrecy, even though they were you know, in the middle of nowhere, that in the notes, he never refers to um, uranium-235. He, refer, he refers to substance 25. And the code was take the, sorry, take the last digit of the atomic number, so it's 92, the last digit of the atomic mass, five, that's your code. So U-235 is 25, U-238 is 28, plutonium is 49 because it's element 94 with uh, atomic mass and so on. So that's what Serber writes on page one as the reason to have brought all these people in secret to the Mesa. Now, which material to use? By this point, there were several known fissionable materials. U-238 is actually mostly stable as had been clar clarified by this point. U-235 is the isotope of uranium that is most readily fissionable. However, it only exists in trace amounts in nature. So if you dig up uranium ore out of the ground, whether in the African mines or in uh, mines out in uh, Western United States or elsewhere, most of the uranium that you'll dig up, is uh, the overwhelming majority will be this very stable isotope U-238. Less than 1% of naturally occurring uranium is of this fissionable kind. And in the meantime, this newest element that Seaborg and his colleagues had made, actually synthesized in the laboratory, plutonium, that is, can be even more fissionable under certain conditions, and yet it existed only in micrograms, not kilograms. So these are the, these are the challenges that, that Serber begins telling the recruits. This is, again, his hand, actually, it's Edward Condon's hands-drawn chart, uh, the chart that Serber showed. This is the level of, of detail and accuracy in the Los Alamos primer, literally taken from the primer. This is showing the, the reaction rates for fission uh, in, in convenient units for these different types of materials. And again, you can see here is uranium-235, here's the common kind U-238, here's plutonium, the four and the nine. So for, for slow neutrons of the sort that Meitner and Frisch were, were thinking about, ones that have been, been slowed by some moderator like in the Chicago pile, the highest reaction rate that had been measured at least was of uranium-235. The highest likelihood to undergo fission was way up here for, two, for 235. The problem was when the next uh, nucleus fissions, the neutrons that come out of that are actually very fast. They're at these kind of um, uh, nuclear energies or at least fractions of the nuclear energy. They're more up in this scale in a million times, say electron volts or 10 million, not a tiny fraction. For very fast neutrons, it turns out plutonium is even more susceptible to fission than U-235. The challenge is, how do you isolate this trace stuff from this, because you want to get a lot of this stuff in one place, kilograms worth, or how do you scale up this stuff by a factor of a billion from micrograms to kilograms? Neither of these seemed pretty, seemed at all straightforward. That's where some of these other facilities then come in. So we'll now look at the Oak Ridge facility very briefly, Oak Ridge in Tennessee. Uh, here's an example of this kind of enormous industrial scale operation under the auspices of the Manhattan Project, scaled up by the US Car uh, 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 Army Corps of Engineers, and now with more and more industrial partners as well. This was literally a, a classified city. It wouldn't even show up on maps until many years after the end of the war. And yet behind the fence, in uh, under classified conditions, they built the single largest factory on the, at the time on the planet the largest factory, at least with, with under one roof ever, uh, with about a mile, uh, if you walk from here to here, the single building was, was um, uh, like more than a mile in distance. This was uh, to try to separate uh, the, the kind of uh, uranium isotope that was now really needed, the fissionable one, from the common one. Now, these are both atoms of uranium. So in terms of any chemical analysis, they will be indistinguishable. The chemical properties are the same. They're isotopes of a single chemical element. So people realized right away and Serber lectured on this, of course, as well. To separate them, you have to turn to physical me methods, not chemical ones. You have to exploit the very tiny percent level mass difference between uh, this slightly lighter version of that more common isotope. So here's an example I'll go through very quickly. 
There's a, a marvelous um, uh, treatment of this uh, by my, my friend and colleague, Alex Wellerstein, who's a real, real expert on, on the wartime nuclear projects. You can check out his very brief uh, essay, sorry, essay there. So here's what they wound up doing uh, in this plant. Here's what's going on in, in this huge, um, enormous factory plant. Something called gaseous diffusion. So you, you mix the uranium with, um, with fluorine to make a gas called uranium hexafluoride, U46. This is incredibly poisonous, incredibly noxious. It will burn through many kinds of gaskets and rubbers and metals. It was really nasty stuff to work with, not just to humans, but even to the kinds of uh, uh, engineering parts that one would build a factory out of. This was hard to work with. Nonetheless, it had the property that they could heat it up in equilibrium the molecules of uranium hexafluoride that happens to include the rare lighter uh, isotope of uranium, those molecules would, be, would enter equilibrium with the more common molecules that happen to include uh, the standard isotope, U238. If they're in equilibrium, their energies should be about balanced. The kinetic energy should be about equal. But that means that the smaller mass here of the lighter isotope must be multiplying a slightly larger velocity that the, the, the molecules with the stuff you want will on average have slightly larger speeds in equilibrium than the more common stuff. So put the whole gas under pressure, force it through these, 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 uh, these chambers with a permeable uh, membrane. And then because you have a larger average velocity for the ones you want, for the lighter ones, they will diffuse through this chamber uh, slightly more quickly. So after a short amount of time, the ones you want, these small black dots, the ones with the fissionable um, uh, isotope, will diffuse throughout the chamber a little bit faster than the ones that are um, uh, stable and that you don't want to focus on. Not by a lot. The enrichment of doing this one cycle is less than 0.4% enrichment. And so the idea was, let's well, just do that a thousand times, literally scale it up uh, like never before with the help of these uh, experienced industrial partners. And so what this building has is literally thousands of these kind of cubic meter scale uh, gaseous diffusion units strung one from the other. You take the slightly enriched output from here and put it in another chamber and output and output and output. So you do this a thousand times. Meanwhile, the other main installation uh, for the Manhattan Project was in uh, Washington state at the Hanford site. And by the way, one of our, um, a member of our group here, Tiffany Nichols, is a real expert on Hanford, so we, we should get her to talk about Hanford sometime as well. So Hanford during the war was also a secret facility, enormous sprawling industrial site. Now here the main partner was DuPont, although many other industrial partners there as well. And the job at Hanford was not first and foremost to separate the um, isotopes of uranium, but actually to, to make more plutonium. So their job was to take kind of Fermi's Chicago pile, take the insights that people like nuclear chemists like Glenn Seaborg had learned in the interim and turn, do that at an industrial scale. It built enormous reactors that could uh, induce neutron capture within uh, otherwise relatively stable uranium and then, and then induce uh, the production of plutonium. And so again, you can see the, the, the scale here. Uh, just to put it in complex, the, there are multiple reactor complexes. There was the B, B reactor, the F complex, and, and many others. All told during the war, Hanford required 1 billion cubic meters of concrete. I just think about the, the, the scale of that going on. Okay, let me pause there. So that's a kind of lightning tour of some of the technical things happening at the, var at the main uh, uh, Manhattan Project sites. And we'll talk more about what comes next. Uh, let's see. So uh, Fisher asked, by the time the transuranics were actually discovered, do people really know about antimatter or neutrinos? Oh, good. Yes, good. So people had ideas, uh, nothing like a real evidence yet. Uh, I'm going to bracket. I won't spend too much time on that. But Fermi had actually uh, done a lot of work creating a theory that included neutrinos and of the weak, weak decay more generally. But it was still entirely hypothetical. And Fermi himself believed these particles would never be detected. He was very skeptical uh, at the time. We'll come to actually, it turns out that the first evidence that neutrinos exist came from these kind of huge nuclear uh, projects, not during the war, but soon afterwards. So people had to build enormous industrial scale reactors or weapons to create lots and lots of these things flying out uh, before there was any hope to try to detect them. And so we can talk more about that. But the short answer is people had ideas about the, what we would now call neutrinos and, and the kind of beta reactions. But, but, but it was still quite fledgling. 
Johan asks, was there widespread protest against the future Japanese? Very good. Very good. It's part of what we should talk about, uh, especially on Monday and, and thereafter. Uh, the, the short answer is no. If you say widespread protest, an unequivocal no, no way, no how. Partly because these projects were all deeply, deeply classified. Many of these sites literally weren't even on a map. You could not drive to the town of Oak Ridge. You wouldn't know it was there during the war. And same with Hanford and many other so-called atomic cities. They were nicknamed after this. So that's part one. Part two, uh, what was gonna happen with these things wasn't so clear. And we'll talk more about that uh, soon. Uh, part three, uh, well, let me leave part three to, to our discussion. It's a great, Johan, that's a fantastic question. And, I, and that's exactly what I wanna uh, be able to talk about, at least, at least broach, uh, both with the film and with our discussion on, on uh, Monday. Um, good. Oh, Muriel shared a screenshot. Uh, excellent. Um, yes, Alex is right. So part of why Oak Ridge was cited where it was was because it had a ready access to enormous, enormous uh, sources of electricity. Uh, it was really just, I mean, you saw the, the, the photos, there was a, a huge industrial output. Um, Sarah says, we will talk about radioactive contamination. Oh, we will. Yes, very good. Uh, so they did, did they, Sarah asked, did they, did people worry about radiation from these materials? Again, Sarah, it's a great, great question. Did they, they were aware of it. It becomes controversial, I have to say, who knew what when. So even with, with hindsight and declassification and lots of more documentary evidence, it's unambiguously the case that many, many of these scientists and engineers knew there was something to think about radiation at the time. It's also unambiguously the case that they were quite cavalier, not just with themselves, but also, and I think even more um, uh, shamefully, with all these workers at these huge industrial sites who were handling extremely dangerous materials with minimal uh, safety precautions or even basic information. It was actually very, uh, there was a dissertation on that very topic uh, by a grad student in, in our own department uh, in, in, uh, in the STS program some decades ago again, based largely on declassified documents and so on. So, so there was knowledge that this radiation existed, that it was harmful to humans. It wasn't clear exactly harmful at which doses, but it was unambiguously harmful in general. There were some precautions taken, but nothing like what would come later. So, so that's a huge, huge question that much more of which is learned actually after the weapons are used. There's a long-term longitudinal study of victims of the bombings in Japan, for example, that, this, that goes on for years. There are then other kinds of experiments uh, and, and more um, controlled studies after, after the Second World War. And we will, so we will talk about that. There's a second film we'll watch together, a second documentary. We'll see in a few class sessions, it looks much more directly at the broader environmental impacts, including radioactivity uh, uh, associated with, with these very, very messy projects. And by the way, just one more plug, I, I showed the book cover. Uh, my, my, my friend and colleague, Kate Brown, who's now also professor at MIT, wrote this really very compelling, very moving book called Plutopia on some of the longer term impacts, um, not just during the 1940s, but even afterwards uh, about these things. So it's a, that's a very important, very good question, Sarah. And we'll have a chance to talk a bit more about that. Um, were these commitments binding? Ah, good, no. So Johan asks, uh, were, were people kind of threatened if they chose to leave? No, and, and yet there was literally one person, one person who left Los Alamos, Joseph Rutblatt is his name, uh, before the project was completed because of what he cited as, as kind of moral concerns, goes back to, to Johan's question. So it wasn't that it was impossible to imagine the consequence of these things. Some people did. Some people thought about it and kept working the project. Some people said, that's not my problem. Some people said someone else will worry about it. And one person at Los Alamos said, this is my problem and I don't like it and I'm leaving. He went on to found the Pugwash movement among other things. So again, great question. We'll talk more about those things. Uh, uh, we'll have an opportunity to talk more about that soon. Let me press on. I want to talk, the last part of, of class is a bit more brief, but I, I don't want to run too long. So let me jump into the next part. These are great, great questions. So last part is, is now, how do people actually construct a device that would explode? How do you make an actual weapon out of these esoteric sounding things? So this last part is actually making bombs, very briefly. So each time we saw, each time a single nucleus undergoes fission, a couple extra neutrons were released. The problem that also is right in Cerber's uh, initial primer, they knew this right from the spring of 1943, was that if you have too small uh, a mass of this fissionable material, then on average, more, too many neutrons will be close to the edge. 
And so they will, they were, they're more likely to fuse right outside of the active region than to stick around and cause more fission. So you have something like a critical size. You, if you have um, a larger volume, the same density, same properties, just more of it, then on average, most of the time a, a new, new neutron is released, it'll be more likely to encounter another target, another nucleus, rather than be close to the edge and kind of fly out and fizzle. So this introduces the notion of a critical size. From there, you can then calculate a critical mass. This is, there's a huge story here uh, you can learn some, some more about in Peter Gallison's really fascinating book called Image and Logic. Also this really amazing resource uh, written by a team of historians and scientists, uh, several of whom actually applied for and received um, top secret clearance so they could actually invest, uh, read classified materials, even though they're, they're all, what they wrote about it would then be subject to, to uh, you know, could only be safe to release. So you have some real insider experts who worked on this other book called Critical Assembly. And a portion of that team is Lillian Hoddison, who wrote the main piece we read for today. So what was happening at Los Alamos was this, a series of kind of hybrid computation, human, almost entirely women, volunteer computers. They were usually the kind of, wives of staff. So the people who were first hired were almost exclusively men to work at Los Alamos. We'll talk more about the kind of uh, gender dynamics in the field around this time that we'll, we'll see that more squarely in a lecture or two. So most of the people who were trained in science or engineering in the US in this time were, were men. Many of them were invited to relocate to Los Alamos with their families. So there were uh, many uh, spouses, mostly women spouses who came along. And many of them were then able to pick up work at the lab as well as computers. That is, the people were named computers. They were usually using these handheld mechanical calculators, not programmable electronic machines. Those were just at the moment under development. So you have these kind of hybrid human machine computing uh, teams. They would break down complicated iterative calculations to try to do things like calculate the, the likelihood for a neutron to, um, to, to leave a, a region of active material or induce fission. Will it, will it drift uh, and diffuse outward or not? So with this kind of series of, of uh, early, what we could call a numerical simulation, but just painstakingly slow, the scientists were able to estimate the critical size above which you're more likely to be in this regime than that. And that was about a radius of nine centimeters. If you had purified an, all, fissionable U-235, and you had a sphere of radius nine centimeters, you'd be more likely to have that thing undergo runaway chain reaction rather than this lo loss of neutrons from diffusion. That then, the size translates to a mass, right? Because you have a, a, a constant density uh, of, of the metal there. So the, the critical size was related to a critical mass of about 50 kilograms, over a hundred pounds of pure U-235 at a time when this existed in tiny trace amounts. Uh, so what, what, uh, what had already been figured out and, and uh, served or lectures on this in the primer is you could actually get by with a much smaller size. You could get by a size closer to this if you surround the active material, the fissionable material, with something called a tamper, a very heavy metal that is, that is very uh, inert to nuclear reactions. So it will neither absorb neutrons nor undergo fission. It'll basically just act like a mirror and bounce those neutrons back in a very heavy, very inert, stable nucleus of which they had ideas of what there might be. That was called the tamper and just put that heavy metal around the, the active region. Then you're gonna reflect these neutrons back in. You can shrink down by a factor of about three, this critical size, and then the critical mass becomes about kilogram scale, not, not um, tens or hundreds of kilograms. So now the question is, how do, you, how do you get this thing to actually undergo a runaway chain reaction? So now you know roughly how much stuff you need for that critical mass. How do you get it to undergo this very rapid uh, energy releasing response? Shall we say, how do you get it to blow up? So here again, all that was identified already from the primer, they knew about this very early. The idea was to get two subcritical pieces. So you're not in danger of either of these pieces, the shaded regions here, uh, undergoing a runaway chain reaction. They're each too small. Neutrons on average will diffuse out before they cause too many fissions. So get two subcritical pieces of this enriched fissionable material and literally shoot them together, like from a, from a musket, from a gun. So they knew there, there were existing army guns actually in use that could get muzzle speeds of projectiles uh, that would correspond to, uh, say, a tiny fraction of a second. The, the velocities were uh, 
were thousands of uh, kind of meters per second uh, or centimeters per second, I guess. So they could get these two subcritical pieces to be jammed together to make one critical mass uh, in a within a tiny fraction of a second. You'd also need to actually induce then, once they're together, you have to inject at least one neutron that can start this runaway chain reaction. They were already thinking about what are called initiators uh, at the time of the primer. The idea was to actually have a natural alpha emitter, something that is naturally radioactive like radium or polonium, glue that onto one of these pieces, attach it to one of the projectiles and have beryllium or some other uh, target on the other piece. They were basically redoing Chadwick's experiment from which he, he identified neutrons. If you, if you have alpha uh, particles smacking into some materials like beryllium, they will produce neutrons. So just do that really fast by gluing the two ingredients of Chadwick's experiment into these pieces in the middle of a bomb. I find that fascinating. They were so confident about this method. I just find this mind boggling. They were so confident they literally never even tested it. The first time any device ever went, underwent a runaway chain reaction from this U-235 gun method uh, assembly was when it was used against a population uh, in the Japanese city of Hiroshima. And you'll see, of course, much more about the actual use of the weapon and, and consequences uh, in the film. So the very first time a device like this was even exploded at all was actually uh, in, a, in a military usage. On October 6th, 1945, many of you might know, we just passed the 75th anniversary uh, of, of these bombings uh, this past summer. So here's what, what is now called the Atomic Dome. For some reason, it's still not so clear. This one building near ground zero uh, was mostly destroyed and yet this kind of dome structure, uh, uh, the skeletal uh, girders of the dome uh, survived. That's now called the Atomic Dome. It was actually kind of uh, industrial management hall in the middle of Hiroshima at the time. So not even testing it. The other uh, method was actually much, much more complicated. And again, you'll hear more about this in the film and we can talk more about it soon too. This became a major challenge and this is the subject of Lillian Hoddison's piece that we read for today. The other kind of fissionable material, the, the material that was even more likely to fission than uranium was this plutonium, but it had a spontaneous fission rate. This was an, a naturally unstable element. That's why it doesn't exist on its own on earth. So the, it is more likely to kind of blow itself apart in, in something other than a runaway chain reaction faster than you could get two of those subcritical pieces to join. No, no matter what the muzzle velocity was, they, were, they came to recognize only by uh, summer of 1944, well past the start of the laboratory, that any of these assembly methods for this highly unstable plutonium would be too slow. So again, as Hoddison uh, 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 tells us in the reading, what they wound up doing was pursuing something called implosion. This became a really very, very significant technical challenge. It leads to all kinds of moral challenges as well. I don't want to downplay those. I just want to say what, what occupied many of these folks uh, during these very hectic days uh, of, the, of the war. The idea was to then get a tiny little plutonium core, actually have it separated into tiny little subcritical pieces, but near each other, surround that with a tamper again, so that it reflect the neutrons back in, but then surround that with multiple kinds of conventional explosives that were shaped into what became known as shaped charges. So, so you want to set up, here's the plutonium fissionable stuff here, surround it with different blocks that are shaped very intentionally with different burn rates. So this kind of basically TNT, one kind of chemical explosive, would have a certain burn rate. You have a different burn rate here, and diff different burn rate here. So you could actually shape the ingoing wave into a spherically symmetric um, shock wave that goes in instead of going out. So you want it with, with very high precision, induce an ingoing wave that will then crush the plutonium core so that all these subcritical pieces are condensed into a single critical mass even more quickly, much, much more quickly than any of those kind of muzzle velocity methods of gun assembly. And we can talk more about that, but that was what was, was the idea. Now that created huge challenges, both theoretical and experimental. How do you calculate the appropriate shapes? How do you actually mix these materials to appropriate um, purity? I mean, lots and lots and lots of challenges there. So this uh, really, the leaders were not so confident this would work on its own. This they did a test of, this became known as the Trinity test. So the film that you'll watch before Monday was called The Day After Trinity. It's referring to this uh, now famous test called the Trinity test, which happened on July 16th, 1945. You can see here's the test uh, uh, bomb about to be uh, exploded uh, after Norris Bradbury leaves the assembly. So this was arranged uh, not too far from Los Alamos. 
Plutonium was so rare, remember there was just barely eking out kilograms worth after that entire industrial effort at Hanford, that at first the idea was to surround this test bomb in an enormous, uh, steel, very thick steel um, container called, literally called Jumbo. <laughs> they had to build a special railroad carrier just because this thing wouldn't fit on standard tracks and get it from where it was made, I think forged in like Pennsylvania, to get it to, to uh, New Mexico ahead of time. So that if the bomb didn't work as expected, they could scrape off this very rare plutonium and try again. In the end, they wound up not using it. But that just gives you an idea of how experimental this was. Here's uh, one of the rare color photographs of the Trinity test. It was so powerful, it fused the desert sand into glass. There was a special material that was dubbed Trinitite, glass from the Trinity test, that covered the desert floor from, these, uh, from the unleashing of these extraordinary forces. So three weeks after that test and just three days after the surprise bombing of Hiroshima, a bomb of that kind, nicknamed Fat Man, a plutonium implosion bomb, was then dropped on the Japanese city of Nagasaki. Again, we just passed the anniversary. And then you can see uh, just, just as a quick version here, there's much more we can talk about, the kind of, of impacts of, of this nuclear weapon on the city there. So many, many more questions to think about of the sort we already uh, were beginning in the chat now. And I wanna, uh, uh, these are important and very difficult questions. I'm gonna take our time with them on Monday. Just some things to think about when you do watch the film. What did, what got people to work on this? Did their own motivations change over time? Why were these things used? How was the decision made to use these new weapons? What really was the impact militarily or strategically on the course of the war uh, as imagined then or now? How do people react beyond these projects once the secret was revealed and so on? Many, many hard questions to ask about there. So I'll stop there. Uh, a good, Alex uh, shares some good uh, resources here. Scott Manley series is indeed excellent. And also uh, I encourage you to go check out uh, Alex Wellerstein's blog as well, tons of stuff. So I'll pause there. Any final questions uh, before we turn to our, our discussion together on Monday? Okay, I'll pause there. Please remember paper two due this Friday. Good luck with the paper. Uh, enjoy the film, it's a hard film, but I hope you'll appreciate the film, I should say. Watch that on your own. And, and then uh, for those who, who are interested and able to spare the time, we'll meet together at our usual Zoom link uh, Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Take care, everyone. See you soon.